Hello, and uh, welcome to a presentation on chronic stress. Uh, I'm going to make the case that chronic stress is a risk factor for your heart health and that you should be mindful of it. Now, to begin with, you should find in your package this sheet. It's called the risk factor tip sheet. And on the back of it, there is a questionnaire. I want you to take a few minutes to fill in these five questions. The first question is, over the last two weeks, how much were you bothered by feeling sad, down, or uninterested in life? You have 10 choices between zero, not at all, did not happen, all the way through to nine, severely. So take a minute, choose the choice that best reflects how you felt in the last two weeks. Then you move on to the next question. Over the last two weeks, how much were you bothered by? Two, feeling anxious or nervous? Again, make your choice. Do the same with all five questions. You can pause the webcast if you need to. We'll get back to how this is going to be of importance to you in understanding your own stress. We'll do that towards the end of the presentation today. Let me move on and talk about what we're going to cover because I think it's important to understand what it is that this talk will do for you and how it's going to help you in your efforts to improve your heart health. First of all, we'll look at stress as it relates to other risk factors for your heart. There's an excellent study done just down the road in Hamilton, Ontario uh, called the InterHeart Study. So we'll look at what that has told us. Next, we'll look at how stress works in the body. It's important to understand what stress is for us day to day. Thirdly, we'll look at chronic stress, which is a risk factor for cardiac health. And finally, we'll look at some of the emotional reactions that we can have if we're recovering from a heart attack or heart surgery. So let's begin with what we know about risk factors. I mentioned the InterHeart study. This was published in The Lancet a few years ago, a very reputable uh, medical journal in Britain. The study itself involved 15,000 patients, all of whom had had a heart attack. And each of those 15,000 patients who'd had a heart attack were compared to a control. That is a person who is the same age as the person who had the heart attack, uh, the same gender, the same education level, and the same type of job. Only one person, the control, had had no heart attack, the other person the heart victim had had a heart attack. And that's the way in research we figure out what are the factors that lead to the heart attack risk. So the study was designed to answer the question of what factors actually predict who has a heart attack and which ones do not. Uh, the good news is that 90% of the risk was predicted by the variables that they studied. And that was the case no matter where the population was. One of the very important contributions of this study is that it looked at subjects from all around the world. You had Europeans, you had Chinese, you had South Asians, black Africans, Arabs, really every area of the world and every kind of culture and ethnic group were included in the study. And as I said, the modifiable factors accounted for 90% of the risk. Now that is good news for you as a heart patient. It means the take home message is that most of the risk that you face is from factors that you can change. And when you compare that with a family history of heart disease, when, they, when the investigators put that factor into the equation after they'd entered in the modifiable factors, the family history of heart disease added an only an additional 1% to the prediction of a risk of heart attack. So the take home message here is there's a lot you can do 
uh, in terms of managing your heart health and the risk that you face going forward. So let's begin with a little quiz. Let me ask you, what factors do you think impact heart disease the most? Now you may want to reflect on what your doctor has told you, what you've learned from colleagues or friends, family members through the years. What are all the factors that you remember have been told are important for your heart health? So take a minute and reflect. You may want to jot a few of them down because I'm going to give you the answer in just a second. Here they are. There are nine factors that the research, uh, the InterHeart study demonstrated actually uh, uh, predict who will or won't have a heart attack. The nine are abdominal obesity. So here we're talking about weight around the stomach. Not your overall body weight because you can certainly be a big boned individual and that is not a risk. Secondly, there is cholesterol level. Your doctor has probably talked to you about that and many of you are on medications to control it. Thirdly, the inclusion of daily fruits and vegetables into your diet is very positive. It actually decreases your risk substantially. Fourth, if you've been diagnosed with diabetes, that is a factor. Fifth, high blood pressure. Some of you will be on blood pressure medications. Sixth, physical inactivity, another factor that pushes you towards higher risk for a reoccurrence. That's why you're taking this program, is to get yourself active and reduce those risks. Seventh, regular alcohol consumption, which the study indicated actually decreases your risk. Now before you go crazy and throw away the wine bottle the stopper when you open it and finish the whole bottle, uh, we're talking here about one drink per day, for men perhaps two. But the idea is that a single drink will relax you a little bit and does seem to contribute to improving your risk. Eighth, smoking, definitely uh, a negative, and ninth, stress. So those are the nine factors. Now I want to ask you to consider two of these are what we could call trump cards, meaning they are more powerful, have more impact on your risk of a heart attack than any of the other nine. Okay, so which two do you think are the most important. Worldwide, the two most important factors are smoking, number one, far and away the biggest risk factor. Number two, cholesterol. Those two account for what percentage of the risk? Again, it's up to 90% that is predicted. What do you think these two factors alone account for? Well, the answer is about 66%, two-thirds of the risk just from those two factors. That's why I call those two the trumps. Now, in addition to those two trump cards, there are four other factors that are not quite as important, but almost. And we'll call those the face cards. They will predominate over some of the other factors. So take a minute and think. What do you think the other four important factors in predicting whether you're at risk for having a reoccurrence of a heart problem are? The answers, abdominal obesity. So if you are overweight or obese, this is an important factor for you to consider making changes in. Secondly, diabetes. If you've been diagnosed as a diabetic or if you have erratic blood sugars, so-called pre-diabetes, you should be mindful of controlling this uh, as well as possible. High blood pressure is the third and stress is the fourth. And the fact that stress plays such an important part is highlighted by one of the conclusions of the interheart study. And if you want, you can look it up. 
page 943 of the report says, raised cholesterol, smoking, and psychosocial, that is stress factors, were the most important risk factors in all regions of the world. Now that's an important point because the study included subjects from all around the world. We sometimes think in Canada, the U.S., that we know what stress is. We live a very hectic life. But in the Orient, maybe they're more placid, more relaxed. Uh, there doesn't seem to be as much uh, stress. Uh, that is more our misunderstanding. The study is clear. Every area of the world, stress is important. Managing stress is a very high priority for every heart patient. So the take-home message from all of this is the inter-heart study tells us uh, there are many factors that influence whether or not we are at continued risk for a recurrent heart attack, and they are all modifiable. So the question for you as an individual heart patient is this. What role does stress play in my life? Am I stressed? In the old days, psychologists used to give inkblot tests. I've provided here an alternative form of that, which is, which of these two cats do you empathize with the most? The stress cat on the left or the cool cat on the right? So we're going to answer that question across the next little while. Before we get to answering that question for you, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about stress and how does it work in the body and why is it that stress shows up so prominently as a risk factor for a heart problem. Well, we have here in this slide a woman who is coming into our center to attend the class and she's crossing Bayview Avenue and she sees a car or hears a car squealing to a stop, screeching to a stop right beside her. Okay? And you can see from the expression on her face that she is reacting. So what does this mean? Well, the signal, that, that is the stressor, the squealing car, the metal that's coming towards her, is registered in the brain, in the hypothalamus. And that hypothalamus, which is a kind of conductor of your stress response, sends its first signal, a quick signal, down through the nervous system on the right side of this slide, and that signal makes its way down to your adrenal glands. The adrenal glands instantly dump adrenaline into the bloodstream. What does adrenaline do? Well, it is a very powerful agent of metabolic arousal, meaning once it's in the bloodstream, you'll feel your heart pumping quickly, you'll feel a little warm and flushed, you may even feel a kind of shock and tingling. So that signal has come through the nervous system, which means it takes almost a second or less than a second before you are responding to the danger. Uh, as well, in your lungs, your bronchial tubes are going to dilate. That allows more oxygen in, and it allows you to respond to the danger. Other changes happen. For example, fibrinogen, which is a clotting agent, is also released into the bloodstream. Now, in the old days when we had to protect ourselves from predators, it was helpful if you got cut or injured in a skirmish and had to run for safety. It was very helpful that you didn't bleed to death on the way. So that is also thrown into the mix. Today, when we rarely get cut or injured when we're under stress, the fibrinogen can effectively become a risk factor. You can see how clotting or increased clotting is not a good thing if you are a heart patient. And finally, peripheral blood flow will decrease because more blood is uh, shunted from your uh, skin and other unnecessary uh, destinations to the large muscle groups in your body, mainly your arms and your legs. So that is the first wave of the stress response, which is triggered through the nervous system. But 
your conductor, the hypothalamus, has a second pathway that it begins to work on as soon as it did the first, but it works through hormones, hormones that are released into the bloodstream and that have to travel to their destination. The first of those hormones is released from the hypothalamus, the CRF, uh, the corticotrophic releasing factor. And I'll just uh, refer to the initials. You don't need to know the names, just that there is a, a uh, entity that is sent as a messenger to the next destination. So the CRF goes to the pituitary gland, which in the old days was called the master gland for the body. And the pituitary gland recognizes it as a call to arms and says, we better get a more effective and more sustained stress reaction going. So it releases ACTH, which makes its way through the bloodstream to its target, which is the adrenal gland, the very same place where the adrenaline was released uh, earlier. By the time the ACTH gets to the adrenal gland, it's been almost a half an hour from the original trigger and the adrenal gland then releases cortisol. Cortisol named because it comes from the cortex of the adrenal gland. What does the cortisol do? Well, the cortisol's job is to increase the available blood sugars. That is the energy level that your body has in order to, to respond to the stress situation. This is done through releasing glycogen <clears throat> and other fatty acids from the liver. Cholesterol, by the way, is a fatty acid. So the cortisol makes us more active. It also makes us a little bit more hungry. Uh, it tends to uh, want to push us towards storing more foods. Okay? Because it is a signal of sustained ongoing stress. So your body is thinking, you know what, we may need energy for a while. So it tends to store more fat. In addition, the cortisol makes the white blood cells in your body more sticky, which in turn helps them to attach onto vessel walls. Now if you have plaque around your heart, those white blood cells get absorbed into that plaque making what's called a foam cell, which is a gooey mess, a caramelly-like gooey mess, which can break or rupture and release all of those substances into the bloodstream. They travel downwind and block the artery, causing a heart attack. So those are the ways that cortisol affect you. As you can see, adrenaline and cortisol combined have a very positive effect. They help you. What do they do? Well, they allow you to respond to danger, threats of all kinds. Threats that come from cars screeching to a halt, threats that come from work challenges, threats that come from other sources as we make our way through our day-to-day -day life. Uh, stress is an instant source of energy. It makes us more aware and able to act when we need to. It's very useful and a reliable warning sign for us. But let's go back to where we started. That's the Interheart study. And the Interheart study told us stress is bad. Stress can cause you to have a heart attack. So how can this be that it's a good thing and it allows us to respond to day-to-day -day challenges and yet it also is considered a risk for your heart health. Well, the answer here to this uh, apparent dichotomy comes from how stress was defined by the, st by the investigators in the interheart study. What they defined as stress is the following. And note that this is very different from the example that we had of the woman crossing Bayview Avenue. First of all, it is chronic stress they were looking for, persistent. Do you have stress at work that is persistent or daily and lasts for months at a time? How about at home? Do you have stress at home that lasts for months at a time?
An example might be if you have an elderly parent living with you who has Alzheimer's and who sometimes wanders away from the house and you constantly wonder, are they going to leave? Will they stay in this evening? So those kinds of constant perpetual stressors are what the investigators were tracking. A third example, patients who said they have persistent financial stress. They're having difficulty paying their rent, getting groceries, paying their bills. And again, an ongoing chronic problem. Or those who indicated that they've had major life changes in the past year. Perhaps another, uh, another medical uh, condition earlier in the year, may, they may have been diagnosed with arthritis or something similar. Um, they may have uh, what's called an external locus of control. Uh, this is a psychological concept. It, it means where do you see uh, changes happening? If it's something that you feel you can make happen, then that's an internal locus of control. If, on the other hand, you feel that change happens to you and that the factors around you are pushing and pulling you in different directions, that's what the investigators call an external locus of control. I'll come back to that in the second talk that I do. And finally, the investigators talked about the person feeling a persistent depressed mood diagnosis of a major depression or something of the like. So that constellation of chronic stress in one's life and a response of depression in the individual, any or all of those or, or a prevalence of those factors is what they called stress. And that is the particular constellation that is unhealthy for your heart. So, let's now look at the difference so we understand with certainty the difference between healthy stress and unhealthy stress. So, positive stress essentially means that your body responds as it is wired and designed to do to a threat or stressor. And once the stressor is induced, you see that there's physiological response with the adrenaline and the cortisol and many other stress hormones. I just covered two. And that response capability is crucial to you protecting yourself. Then, once the danger is passed, it's important that your body be able to recover quickly and efficiently. And that's the part that's important. Now, in contrast, the situation that Interheart study was looking at is where your stressors are persistent or unremitting or chronic. They go on and on. So let's take this example on this chart. You go to work on Monday morning. You're given a job that you had no way of planning for. You feel stressed. You somehow get it all done and hand it in. You come back Tuesday, there is another crisis and you have to deal with that. And so on right through the week. Every day, additional challenges, additional hits of stress. So what does that do to you? Well, for your physical functioning, it has a number of consequences, largely by virtue of the cortisol circulating. First of all, you'll feel more hunger. Your sleep patterns will become disrupted. Uh, hypertension is aggravated. Uh, cholesterol levels increase by virtue of the higher fatty acids that are circulating. And of course, across time, you're going to have increased abdominal fat deposits. Across time as well, your immune functioning begins to be impacted and you don't respond as effectively to colds, flus, and other challenges. So that's the physical side. What about the psychological side? Well, here too, you will find some clear reactions. What do these include? Well, first of all, the stressed or the chronically stressed person will typically feel a high level of tension. 
uh, perhaps a sense of self-doubt or inadequacy. Am I doing the right thing? Am I good enough to do this job? And so forth. Uh, they may even feel irritability or anger. That in turn can lead to increased friction in their interpersonal relationships and in some cases chronic reactivity. Uh, we'll get to some of those chiefly anxiety, depression and anger as three examples of chronic emotional reactivity. For some people the existence of all of this internal strife leads them to patterns that have worked for them in the past. That's normal. We feel upset, we feel rattled, we need to calm down. Smokers have found that if they take a cigarette, they'll feel calm, they'll feel more relaxed. That's part of what keeps them smoking. Or others will reach for a drink or have a, a drink at lunch or after work or a nightcap. So the drinks, the smokes and so forth are ways that we have of trying to bring down into a comfort level that we're, we're happy with or that we can live with that stress, that chronic stress reaction. In some cases people begin to feel hopeless, suicidal or uh, violent. Now, what we talked about in the example we gave was the situation where the woman's crossing the street and there's a single stressor and it's coming from outside the person. However, human beings have a prefrontal cortex, a whole part of the brain where they can anticipate problems. They use symbols, they use words, sentences. Uh, they understand what is going to happen before it happens. And those symbols and those ideas and, and going over possible things that could go wrong uh, is actually something that by itself can trigger your stress reaction. So in the slide here I point out to the connection between ruminating about certain problems. Let's take the example of the person going into work Monday morning and they haven't even showed up to work and they're worrying about all the bad things that could happen. Okay? So all of those thoughts and ideas are not benign. They will activate your stress reaction including the production of cortisol and keep what's called the HPA axis or the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal gland axis. That is your stress system going and going and going. So what is the downside of that kind of chronic stress? Well, it means that your cortisol levels for one, to take one element of the stress reaction, become high. Your body is bathed in as it were, cortisol. What does that do? Well, one thing it does is it flattens out your circadian rhythm, the presence of cortisol through the day and before you go to bed makes it very hard to get to sleep or to stay asleep through the night. In addition, cortisol will begin to block the action of insulin and we understand that insulin resistance is the first step to what? Diabetes. That's right. We also seek more fatty foods in our diet when we're stressed. To make this point, I often ask people, when they're stressed, how many of you reach for carrot sticks or celery sticks? Rarely. Most often what you'll do is go for some potato chips, a donut and a coffee, or um, something of the nature, perhaps a beer and pretzels in the pub. Uh, it, that in turn will enhance storage of energy as abdominal fat. So you may already be seeing the parallel between this list in front of you and the earlier list we had of the interheart risk factors. Okay, you can see diabetes, you can see uh, abdominal obesity, uh, and so forth. The other things that cortisol will do, it promotes the loss of protein in muscles. Protein is the energy burning part of your body. It, whatever you're taking in, it's the protein and the muscle, muscle fiber that burns those calories for you. 
If you lose some of that, the problem is you have less furnace to burn the calories you're taking in, hence even more abdominal fat. In addition, minerals are lost from the bone, and there's also atrophy of the hippocampus. That's the part of the brain responsible for memory. So you may find yourself being a little more forgetful and having difficulty focusing your thoughts. So those are the reactions that you will see with chronic stress, uh, mediated by, in large part, the cortisol production. Let's now ask the question of how do our emotions and our emotional reactions tie into this stress reaction picture. And here, what I want to bring to your attention is uh, Dr. Brian Baker, who's the consulting psychiatrist at our center, does come in to uh, Rumsey Road and delivers some lectures, uh, one of which is called From Event to Recovery. And in that talk, he spells out the various emotional reactions that we have to an event like a heart attack or heart surgery. And there's a, a variety of stages that are important for you to be aware of. I'm not going to go into this in as much detail as Dr. Baker does, but I would highly recommend that you all consider attending his lecture. What I'm going to focus on a little bit more is the kind of barriers that this, these emotional reactions can leave for you as a heart patient. And in particular, we're going to focus on anxiety, anger, and depression. Now, in terms of the normal stages of reaction, I will just say that there are about five or six stages that we go through. The important point here is that this all takes time. It's not going to be something that you will be over inside of a week or two. One of the most important things that patients tell me with great regularity is they go to the hospital, they've had the stent put in, the doctor tells them, your heart is good to go, you're 100%. Go back to your usual routines and activities. And that may be from the pump perspective, but from the point of view of the person who is dealing with what just happened to them, there are often a whole series of reactions that you have to sort out and work through. And these will take a good deal of time. I'm thinking between six months and a year to sort it all out and to move forward from what has happened. The first reaction is always shock. How could this happen to me? I tend to be health conscious. I do try to exercise. Why me? That shock is generally followed by some denial, right? The sense of it couldn't possibly be true. They must have mixed up results. It can't be me. Um, and why denial? Well, here the point is how many of you like to be out of control or like the feeling of being out of control in your lives? Very few. It's not a pleasant experience. We don't like it. So we, to, to guard against it or to fight it off, what we try to do is just use denial initially as a first line of defense. Now, as the denial wears off, you begin to feel your emotional reactions. So the emotions rise to the top. Here, the person's saying, why me? Why did it have to be me? Uh, I don't need this at this point in my life. And the range of feelings can be from irritation to anger to sadness to shock, a whole range of emotional responses. After this, there's a period of kind of negotiating with yourself in order to begin to improve some of the lifestyle challenges you face. At some point along the way, there might be some sadness, especially if some of your uh, abilities have been limited. Perhaps you can't play tennis or golf for the time being, and that does impact you, and it does impact your self-esteem. 
finally, if you persist and you keep at it and you sort out your feelings, you do get to a point of acceptance. However, again, I underline acceptance takes time. It takes some communication between you and your family and those around you. But if you keep that up, you can learn to deal with cardiac disease without having to focus on it constantly. We know cardiac disease is a chronic health condition. It means that you have to live your life in accordance with how you should manage it, not according to how you used to live it before your heart attack. So some changes are typically helpful. Certainly as you move forward in your treatment and your rehabilitation, uh, you're going to find that you're going to organize and reorganize what you do with your family, in your work life, and socially. And you're going to find that the new normal situation or new normal uh, pattern is perfectly fine and works really well. So why is it that there are some patients and actually from our findings, as many as half of heart patients will struggle with some ongoing emotional reactivity, including anxiety, depression, and anger. Well, the reason comes from the way in which the brain is structured. Now, we started with the hypothalamus as the director of the stress response. And uh, this slide here lists the elements of the limbic system. The limbic system is your motivational system and it is the one that manages and controls your emotional state. And the hypothalamus, as we saw earlier, controlled your autonomic function. That was the first wave of the stress response that gave us adrenaline. And also controls the endocrine functions, which was the second wave that gave us cortisol. It also regulates emotions very, very important. And there is a supporting cast that works with the hypothalamus, which includes the amygdala, uh, which is very important for uh, responding emotionally, spotting danger. Uh, the cingulate gyrus, which regulates aggressive behavior, your emotionality, your anger, and so forth. So those entities all work together and when you have a stress, especially a profound stress like a heart attack or heart surgery, many of those other interlaced functions are also uh, stimulated and uh, uh, struggling. In this slide we're looking at anxiety and many patients who've had heart surgery, even if they didn't have a heart attack, are plagued with a, a, an ongoing state of emotional nervousness and fear. Uh, that may be because of the surgery itself. It may be from the moment of truth of having to sit down and read what are the risks of the surgery and reading some of the negative possible consequences. So many patients will have begun to feel anxiety after those initial uh, triggers. And of course, if that anxiety is not addressed, it does risk to compromise your outcome. Why would you feel, why would you continue to feel anxiety even after the hospital? Well, there's many, many good reasons. First of all, every patient will be in a state of uncertainty. They will be saying, what's going to happen to my health? Will I recover? Uh, they may have some fear of complications or permanent limitations. For example, many patients will feel shortness of breath. Some patients will feel angina when they start to exercise. And of course, as they experience those side effects, those symptomatic difficulties, the first thought that occurs to them is, will this last forever or will I get over it? There may also be a fear about not being able to make changes in the lifestyle that led them to the heart attack and heart problem to begin with. And for some, there may also be a fear of losing control or perhaps even of dying from a heart attack. So many reasons that anxiety can remain active for a period of time. The third 
emotional reactive uh, response is anger. Again, by itself, anger is a normal reaction. Uh, the expression of anger within any person depends on the situation they're facing. It can be as minor as an irritation or in some cases uh, of a great rage. Um, and of course as far as your heart health goes, it will be a negative factor uh, if you're experiencing anger and irritability on a constant basis, sort of week in and week out. I have many patients who come to me and say, I used to be such an easygoing person. Prior to my heart event, everything just rolled off of me. I didn't respond to those kinds of situations. Uh, now, my wife speaks to me a certain way around the breakfast table and I snap at her. So that kind of reactivity is very common among many of our patients. Also, if you're expressing your anger in inappropriate ways, uh, like shouting or talking loudly or throwing things, etc., can be a problem for you as a patient. And the third uh, major reactive emotion that I want to highlight is depression. We know from studies done in the last 10 to 20 years, it's twice as common among our heart patients as it is in the general community. Uh, if it's uh, active, if you're feeling down and depressed, it affects you in various ways. It certainly is going to affect your prognosis, how well you'll be able to respond to the challenge of rehabilitation. It might affect your memory. It will certainly affect your motivation uh, to do things like just getting out every day and doing your exercise routine. Um, so it will have an impact on your quality of life. So how do you know whether you're depressed or not? Well, there's two main patterns that I see in the patients. One is the one that we all think of as depression, where the person feels very sad, very down in the dumps, perhaps they begin crying or sobbing when they start thinking or talking about their heart health. Uh, so the, the sadness and the down mood is very prominent. So that is one pattern. The other pattern, which many times is not recognized as depression, but is the same syndrome is where the person has lost their interest in things they used to enjoy. Let's take the example of someone who used to have a wood shop downstairs and enjoyed going down and puttering in the wood shop making things. Or a woman who made quilts or did needlepoint. Or someone who looked forward to going out Saturday mornings and having a coffee and reading the paper at the corner coffee shop. Now, when a friend phones and says, are you coming down Saturday morning? The patient shrugs their shoulder and says, I don't really feel like it. I'm not up to it. Go ahead without me. Okay. That, that uh, experience of feeling flat, of not enjoying things that used to uh, really make you feel happy, you used to draw some pleasure from, used to interest you, and you looked forward to them, now that feeling of interest and pleasure is absent or gone. So either of those two variations, really uh, strong negative sad feelings, or the absence of interest or pleasure qualify you for possibly having a depression uh, or a depressive syndrome. But it is not enough by itself. What we talk of as depression includes a number of other signs along the way. Some of these have to do with your body and some have to do with your psychological uh, uh, sort of experiences. Now in terms of your body we call these cluster of uh, experiences vegetative. Perhaps a bad word but vegetative meaning signals in the body. Uh, they include uh, the experience of a loss of appetite. 
you don't feel like eating. You might eat mechanically because you know you should, but your appetite is gone. In some cases, people lose weight, 5 pounds, 10 pounds, together with the loss of appetite. A second element of this is losing your sleep um, efficiency. So having poor sleep, having disrupted sleep, and as a result, feeling fatigued during the day, feeling flat and tired around the clock. And the third element is losing interest in sexual activity, not caring anymore about whether you do or don't engage in sexual activity. So those three are vegetative signs. You could also perhaps add the experience of what's called psychomotor agitation. That's a kind of restless energy where you just feel kind of full of this energy, makes you want to move around, but you go from here to there, you're still not at peace or comfortable with yourself. It kind of persists uh, and pushes you to go and move and move and move. Or, in some cases, the opposite of that, called psychomotor retardation, or slowing down, where you're doing something but very slowly. Uh, the other psychological signs of depression, well, the prominent one is a tremendous sense of helplessness or of profound despair. What is going to become of me? Very common among many of our patients. Uh, there could be a sense of guilt or uh, another element that we see fairly frequently, a sense of loss of self-worth. Uh, heart patients will tell me they feel now like they are damaged goods. They may have difficulty in their thinking, in their thought process, concentration on things that they used to be able to track very easily is now difficult. Take the example of watching TV. You're watching TV after 10 or 15 minutes. You forget who was this character, what was the plot, what was happening. So the concentration affects them. Or they may have difficulty making decisions, even fairly routine decisions. They ruminate about them and feel flustered. Or in some cases, even thoughts of death or suicide. So those are the elements of emotional reactivity, anxiety, depression, anger, that are found very, very commonly among our patients and tend to be risk factors as Interheart showed us. So how does all of this apply to you? That is the most important question that you face. You remember at the beginning, I suggested you should take a minute to fill in this questionnaire. So let's take a look at your answers now. What do they mean? So let's suppose you circled the questions in this way. So there'll be some sixes, perhaps a one or a zero or two, uh, maybe an eight, three, four, whatever. What's important? What tells us that you might be in some degree of difficulty? Well, in studies we've done with our patients, what we suggest as a trigger or as a threshold is six. If you've rated any of these items as a six or above, six, seven, eight, or nine, it means that that element is a risk of some description for you. So, what should you do? Well, the first thing you should do is just think about it. Has this been a problem for you persistently? And is it continuing? Uh, is it getting worse? And how does it affect you in terms of being able to do your day-to-day -day tasks? How does it affect you in terms of being able to do your exercise prescription? Uh, does it impact you in any of your day-to-day -day activities with other people at work or socially? If your answer to those questions is, yes, I think it is, I think it does affect me, then I would urge you to consider talking it over with your cardiac supervisor for the home program, that would be Kessary, or your family doctor, 
or you can call the social worker or psychologist here at Toronto Rehab and we'd be happy to meet with you and discuss it further and find out what's happening for you. In addition, I'm going to mention some resources at the end of the other companion lecture that you can view. Uh, so there are many choices, there are many things that you can do and you should do. If you've indicated or, or, or shown that you know you have some concern about one of those five areas, then don't ignore it, don't leave it, consider what action needs to be done. Finally, if you do have some questions that this uh, presentation has stimulated, I certainly welcome you to email me and I'd be happy to try and answer those questions as best I can. Thank you and good luck in your struggle with your stresses.